Hello. In 1967, to go to BYU professors into an amplified vision of training future generations of Mormon artists, then elder Spencer W. Kimball invoked the names of canonical artists of Western culture. By doing so, he opened a discussion that has continued within the Mormon community for 50 years. He asked, why cannot we discover, train, and present many Paganinis and other such great artists? He listed sterling examples in a grand theoretical what-if they included creative artists Shakespeare, Wagner, Verdi, Bach, Handel, Shaw, Liszt, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, Goethe, Rembrandt, and Raphael, and another group of performing artists of similar stature. In essence, he asked, where's the Mormon Michelangelo? Can't Mormon artists be great? He did not, however, define what great means. I think we'd all agree that an ingredient list of greatness includes superior technical mastery and astonishing innovation. Such attributes alter the courses of art history by creating artworks that so far outshine and outthink their peers that they elevate the very idea of what is possible. And President Kimball's roster of artists exemplifies these qualities. I would also argue that a key component of artistic greatness is relevance. Beyond technique and creativity, there must be content, and it ties into influence. I ask myself, what did the plays, poems, and essays of Shaw and Shakespeare mean to theater goers and readers? What influence did the music of Verdi and Wagner have on the actions of politicians and patrons in Europe? What power did Goethe exercise? What effect did Bach have on court? And so on and so forth. This concept of relevance is key to an understanding of why art matters in society, whether it lasts, and what its powers ultimately are. I also believe it to be a missing component in the discussion of Mormon art, and often absent from a wish list of qualities from LDS artists themselves. Rather than discuss the philosophical possibilities of art and how Mormon artists in particular have achieved or not the vision of President Kimball, today I would like to present the example of a single Mormon artist whose name might be new to you and explore how his art, fashioned in a time of global turmoil, provides a template of how Mormon artists can engage in the world, affect change, and create work that aspires to greatness. That was the magic button that was supposed to have moved my slide to the next thing. <laughs> because when you're talking about an artist, if you can show the art, you get extra credit almost. <laughs> This is the magic arrow right there. Dig it. I'm an ant. <laughs> well, Joseph Paul Horst was born in Essen, Germany in 1897, joined the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in 1924, immigrated to the United States in 1930, and lived the rest of his life in St. Louis, Missouri. He died in 1947 at the age of 50. Lest you discount his importance to the history of American art and to Mormon art because you may be unfamiliar with him, here is a partial listing of his American Museum exhibitions during his lifetime. The Metropolitan Museum of Art, the Whitney Museum of Art four times, the Art Institute of Chicago, Library of Congress, San Francisco Museum of Art, Corporate Galleries, the New York World's Fair, Kansas City Art Institute, Nelson Atkins Museum, Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts, Carnegie Institute, St. Louis City Art Museum, Art Institute Dayton, Museum of Art Toledo, Golden Gate Exhibition, Virginia Museum of Fine Arts, even the White House. What would the visual artists in this room today give to exhibit in any one of these institutions? These are Vorst Museum credits. After his death, his art entered into additional public collections of significance, including the National Gallery, the Smithsonian, Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art, and others. He also showed in commercial fine art galleries of distinction and great import historical importance in St. Louis and here in New York City and elsewhere. I want to get to Vorst's work as quickly as possible rather than spend too much time on biography. So, here's the briefest possible overview 
and rapid-fire slideshow. He grew up in poverty in a family of 10 children in western Germany. His father died before Vorst turned 21. As a teenager, Vorst fought and was injured in World War I. His art studies include unsurpassed access to German modern masters. His conversion to the church altered the path of his work. He knew and drew royalty and heads of state. After being roughed up by Nazi stormtroopers, he became, as he put it, of anti-Nazi mind. His peers and teachers were labeled degenerate by the National Socialist German Workers Party. The word Nazi is a truncation of National Socialist. A degenerate artist was forbidden to exhibit or sell their work or teach. Upon arriving in the United, Sta in the United States, at the beginning of the Great Depression, Vorst settled near relatives in St. Louis. His commitment to the Mormon Church continued. He visited Salt Lake City to do temple work and exhibited art in Utah. He became involved with the St. Genevieve Art Colony in Missouri and its leading artist teachers, Thomas Hart Benton and Joe Jones. These two led important American movements of the day, regionalism, a style that depicted the people and landscape of America's heartland, and social realism, similar subject matter but with the goal of affecting change politically. Vorst's award-winning and widely exhibited work fits into both of these philosophical camps. Vorst knew poverty intimately. Here's a passage from the only document the artist wrote about his childhood. I was not very old, however, before my father found that I showed talent in drawing with pastel and managed to send me to an art school aided by several scholarships which I was fortunate enough to have awarded me. Although I did not have to pay any tuition, I nevertheless had to supply my own art materials. Of course, most of the time, it was impossible for me to buy these materials, and so I picked up from the floor of the schoolroom pieces of charcoal and thumbtacks which the more fortunate students had thrown away. For drawing paper, I used the back side of wallpaper. My teacher, Carl Hepka, soon noticed these things because he himself had gone through similar experiences in his early training. Occasionally, he would give me a piece of good drawing paper, or the drawings done by previous students, the backs of which I used. In 1929, Germany's political landscape was unsettled. The waning years of the troubled Hindenburg presidency were leading to the seizing of power by Hitler in 1934. Vorst left Germany, but he traded it for something almost as perilous, the Great Depression in America. The Depression hit St. Louis hard. In 1932, 20,000 businesses fell into bankruptcy in the United States, and wages fell 40%. In St. Louis, 30% of the population was unemployed, but for African Americans in the city, the rate of unemployment or underemployment was dramatically higher. It reached 80%. Furthermore, for a city of its size, St. Louis, the fourth largest city in the nation, spent far less on relief than others, 38% less per capita. The St. Louis poet, Oric Glenday Johns, noted that the poor in St. Louis camped in a Hooverville shantytown one mile long. He wrote, I had never seen such stark destitution as on the riverfront of South St. Louis. The people were practically imprisoned there discouraged by police and watchmen from going into the city. There's no doubt that Vorst suffered financially as a recent immigrant artist. He spoke later of these lean days, of trying to sell paintings at Sears and on crowded St. Louis street corners for as little as 50 cents, and even that without success. But there were others worse off than he. In the final week of 1936, the rains began in the Ohio Valley. Over a period of roughly one month, the storms continued and rivers rose to historic levels throughout Ohio, Tennessee, and Arkansas. The United States Weather Bureau estimated at the time that the 1937 storms brought 165 billion tons of water into the region, enough to submerge 200,000 square miles to a depth of 11 inches. The devastation was immediate and overwhelming. Entire cities were evacuated. These were winter storms, and they were accompanied by temperatures that dropped into the teens. The rain turned to sleet. Melting snowfall exacerbated the challenges. And rescue crews of several thousand WPA workers dispatched from Washington 
as well as Coast Guard and other responders, battled large chunks of ice that capsized their boats. Gas supplies were flooded and leaked into the rivers, which caught fire. The result was a horrifying scene. Burning buildings, recently capped in snow, sleet, and ice, were now surrounded by a smoldering lake of contaminated water. To aid those whose land was damaged, the Federal Resettlement Administration initiated a program to help suffering farmers. Loans of assistance granted $18 a month until the next harvest, but this money was paid to landowners, not sharecroppers and tenant farmers. The result being that the workers of the land, who were already living tenuously, became destitute. In all, 385 people died during the Great Flood of 1937. It is estimated that the damage was $500 million, or its inflation adjusted amount today, about $8 billion. The flood made one million people homeless. Vore's celebrated images of the flood brought him national attention. They differed from documentary pictures created by his peers who were dispatched by local newspapers in, the, in that Vorst's work transcended illustration. They were intended to be seen as fine art. It's notable that his subject matter, which concentrated on those already most at risk, included animals. Other natural disasters captured his attention as well. Stirring images of crop failures and storms tied to the Dust Bowl west of Missouri include a series of prayer pictures in which the people in the paintings are so utterly distraught and physically battered that they have no choice but to fall to their knees. These are more than documentary pictures, however. Vorst used natural catastrophes as a metaphor to warn of the oncoming political storm of another world war. Related to these disaster images are, are World War II works like For Thine is the Kingdom, in which the father of a soldier prays for his son. The newspaper opened on the floor of his dilapidated room notes that the Yanks have entered Germany. Vorst was saying in these works, it's not enough to acknowledge tragedy and disaster, to document it, or to attempt to achieve sympathy for its victims. A truly Christian response requires its believers to do something, to alleviate suffering, to stand up against tyranny, to ameliorate inequality through action. Vorst's 1930 paintings are often a call to arms. Maybe it's off script, but I do think the untapped potential of Mormon art, something that would transcend its frequent pathways of retelling its own story or illustrating its scriptures, is this concept. It's one thing that would nudge it toward greatness, simply to make art that matters. Vorst's success in capturing the Great Depression, not from a theoretical vantage point of a city or a nation in the distance, but from a closely observed lens of his own community relationship, relationships, empowered and emboldened him to tackle hatred and fear elsewhere. This is paradoxical because in the United States, his German background was constantly thrown in his face by the press as a veiled way to minimize his voice as a commentator on American issues. He was never able to escape the association with Germany and be as all-American as he wished. Still, this unfair treatment did not preempt his American patriotism as World War II neared, nor his desire to tackle social issues that would make the country better. Now I'd like to give a single example of a social issue of the 1930s and demonstrate how Horst and other artists reacted to it. I think it shows how artists can use their work to, to build public awareness for moral issues, change minds, encourage action, and seek to rally consensus for progress. Mob lynching had been on the decline in the early 20th century, but it reemerged forcefully in the 1930s. Scholars have pointed to numerous causes for mob violence aimed at African Americans, yet lynching included the murder of women, children, Native Americans, Jews, Chinese, Italian, and Mexican immigrants, too. Nevertheless, most often, lynching involved black men murdered in public at the hands of white men. Lynching was much more common than many have supposed. A recent multi-year investigation by the Equal Justice Initiative uncovered documented cases of 3,959 racial lynchings of African Americans in Alabama, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Kentucky, Louisiana, Rolling Carts, Mississippi, North Carolina, South Carolina, Tennessee, Texas, and Virginia between 1877 and 1950. Vorst most likely encountered lynching almost immediately 
after immigrating to the United States. On October 12, 1930, less than three months after his arrival in St. Genevieve, where Vorst initially settled, two black men and a woman fought and killed two local white male quarry and kiln workers. They said they were defending the woman against rape. But angry citizens of St. Genevieve retaliated by driving all of the 200 African American residents out of the small town and threatened lynchings. Most Americans outside of the South had no exposure to murder and terrorism of this kind. Two art exhibitions in New York City in 1935 sought to change public opinion of the support and support two anti-lynching bills making their way through the legislature. The first exhibition, sponsored by the NAACP, an art commentary on lynching, featured an introductory essay to an exhibition catalog titled appropriately, Pictures Can Fight. These were not fringe exhibitions. In addition to Benton and Jones, participating artists included John Stuart Curry, George Bellows, Reginald Marsh, Isamu Noguchi, Jose Clemente Orozco, Paul Cadmus, Louis Lozovic, Harry Sternberg, Julius Block, and others. It's also worth noting that a number of these artists were Jewish, and their immediate experience with anti-Semitism informed their sympathies with racism of all kinds. Further, many of the artists commonly used the imagery of the crucifixion in their works relating to lynching, thereby imparting a Christian zeal into their documentation of violence. The two exhibitions brought many citizens face to face with lynching for the first time. Newspapers reported that some gallery visitors were physically overcome. But an, but an art commentary on lynching and struggle for Negro rights, organized by the John Reed Club Artists Union at ACA Galleries, proved that visual artists could harness their outrage and engage the public with an aim to effect change. Forrest as yet had not shown work in New York City that would take place the following year at the same ACA galleries that had mounted struggle for Negro rights. But he created an image gallows that easily fits into the group of social realists and anti-lynching works. In this painting, Vorst paints the aftermath of a hanging. A makeshift scaffold is partially surrounded by a loose timber structure. High above is an empty noose, and the smoke from the fire directly below the rope winds its way up into the sky and converges with white clouds, clouds against a darkened night and full moon. The site is on a hill alongside a river, and in the paintings, the men and women descend down a path in single file away from the gallows. A woman has collapsed into the arms of an old man, and a Missouri farmer, noted by the large brimmed hat that Vorst frequently used as a symbol of his adopted state, sits on the log fence, his head bowed. At the far right of the image, a Missouri mule sips innocently from a trough of water. A number of symbols appear in the image. These include the mule, the farmer, the river, and a dead tree whose leafless branches reach upward toward the sky. Perhaps the most central symbol of all is the pole that stands at tilt between the figures and the gallows itself. It is long and thin with a horizontal beam at the top that echoes the cross. Vorst's Missouri Mormon identity informed his reaction to hatred and violence, just as anti-Semitism mobilized American Jewish artists. Around 1939, Vorst prepared submissions for a public mural commission. One of the works was Religious per Persecution. It was created 100 years after the Hansville Massacre, known locally in Missouri as the Mormon War. <clears throat> Vorst would tackle additional social issues throughout his career, including fascism in Europe. This must have been especially troubling to him, as his entire immediate family remained in Germany. His hometown of Essen, a primary source of German munitions during World War II, was a nearly constant target of Allied bombing from 1939 to 1945. All told, 272 raids, air raids, destroyed 90% of the city of Essen. The remaining city, the outskirts, was 60% destroyed. As someone said of the relentless bombing, making ruins of ruins. These were fi there were fissures in the Vorst family as well. Joe was staunchly anti-fascist, but one brother was a Nazi soldier who was ultimately captured by the Allied troops. The two brothers never reconciled, as can be seen in the tone of these paintings of him by Vorst. After years of working as a WPA artist creating public murals, Vorst joined the U.S. military effort 
like many artists of his day, and created propaganda for war posters. In the last century, World War II propaganda is probably the readiest example of government's use of artists to influence the population for a cause. Forced was sincere, however. One week before the surprise Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, Vorst prepared for a solo show of his paintings here in New York. He published an essay in the exhibition catalog that ended with this statement. As a token of my appreciation for the privilege of living as an American, as an American citizen in this great country of freedom of expression, and for the honor of being commissioned to paint three murals for the United States Post Offices, I donate all proceeds over and above expenses to national defense organizations. Finally, I want to show two forced works from the late 30s and early 40s. The first is a World, propaganda, World War II propaganda work, This is the Enemy. Its title was taken from President Roosevelt's first war message given to Congress January 6th, 1942. I don't think for a minute this is what President Kimball had in mind when he was projecting the greatness onto future Mormon artists. But Boris can't be faulted for doing his part for the war. And given his personal complex German identity and his meeting of Hitler in 1932 to draw him for a commission, this is more than an uninformed cartoon. Here is another work, Drought, from 1938. Look at the individual narrative and symbolic components of it. Note how every visual element speaks to this tortured man's state of mind. He's without options. Everything is fed up. He's been forced to his knees. In my life, I have felt this helpless a time or two. Perhaps you have as well. To me, this painting is one of the most powerful works by a Mormon artist. I'd seen rep rep uh, reproductions of the painting, but when I walked into a dimly lit space in a private collector's home and stood before it last year, I was emotionally overcome. My thoughts raced. Gradually, my mind led me to questions of Mormon artists' relevance. What would it be like, I wondered, if from the thousands of living artists in the church, including writers, composers, filmmakers, etc., even a handful of the best of them looked more frequently to current events for their subject matter, what kind of art might come as a result from such a shift? Back to drought, I wondered what church members in 1938 would have thought of this work had Vorst been more widely known to them. Maybe I'm wrong, but I imagine Spencer W. Kimball might have liked this painting very much. He wanted Mormon artists to lengthen their stride too. Isn't social engagement part of the package that accompanies artists of importance? Maybe this kind of work isn't for every artist or for every viewer, but I question whether an entire artistic culture can avoid contemporary relevance and still aspire to greatness. My own experience working with LDS artists over a decade has led me to the conclusion that many Mormon artists want, almost more than anything else, including the ability to pay the rent, to be of use to the church. This yearning for institutional utility runs very deep in our artists. Increasingly, they also want to matter. How can these impulses be reconciled? I wonder whether Vorst's artworks aren't one solution. Dear artist, he seems to say, take the high ground on social issues that are also clearly moral issues. Show the dangers to men, women, and children of disasters, natural and man-made. Draw upon your own experiences and passions and react with the love of Christ to those most in need of help, not merely those down on their luck, but the disadvantaged. One of Vorst's private collectors was the Pulitzer Prize-winning author John Hersey. In 1947, the year that Vorst died of a brain aneurysm while leading his ward choir in St. Louis, Hersey wrote of Vorst and his work, He loves his family. He has integrity about his work. When, Vorst, when Joseph Vorst is at his best, he catches, I think, a glimpse of humanity, of suffering and happiness at once, of all those things in men and around them that make them what they are. That is why I like Horst's work. Thank you very much.